All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to the machine learning one class. And I heard that West Lafayette got a snowstorm. I hope everyone is doing well, and、um, hopefully I can see you in person soon. Because of the、um, unstable Zoom connection、um, today, I'm plan to do this flipped classroom so that you will watch this pre-recorded video about、uh, today's material. And then I will host a Q and A session during our、uh, regular meeting time. So,、um, a, a quick a、uh, few announcements first. First,、uh, the homework is due today, on Thursday at five p.m. And、uh, you don't need to follow any template to submit your homework. Just submit it as one file. And second,、uh, quiz one will start today, and it you will have forty eight hours to do it. Once you start, you will only have sixty minutes. All right. So before you start your quiz, please have、uh, your course notes, have your homework、uh, with you, so you don't need to find them when you do the quiz. All right. So last time we talked about two different ways to、uh, regularize a linear regression problem, namely the ridge regression and the lasso. So first, let's have a very quick review of them. So ridge regression, the、um, loss function, is、uh, the square difference between the ground truth and、uh, the prediction plus、uh, lambda times the the regularization term, which is the two norm squared. Okay, and the lasso. Has a pretty similar form, except for the regularization term, which uses a one norm. Okay, and this one norm is just the the absolute value sum of every element. Oh, sorry, sum of absolute value of every element of this theta vector. So the ridge regression and lasso. They both have pros and cons. So for ridge regression, as we have discussed, it gives you an analytical solution because the loss function is differentiable. Therefore, it has a lot of well-established theoretical guarantees for this regression, and the algorithm is simple. It's just one equation, and then you can get the result. However, the the problem of it is that it's hard to interpret the theta. Um, that you find、uh, from this optimization, because、um, this、uh, ridge regression just to penalize the overall magnitude of、um, the theta vector, okay, and it does not reflect the nature of certain problems such as sparsity. However, lasso、uh, is、um, a method that will、um, promote sparsity in. The optimize the theta, and it has proven applications in many domains such as images and speeches, okay, and、uh, it's it echoes particularly well、uh, in modern deep learning because、um, in modern deep learning where the parameters of the models are very large,、um, that means this theta is、uh, very high dimensional.、Uh, in those cases, your theta. Uh, needs to be sparse, and lasso is、um, penalizing the theta for not being sparse, which is great. Okay, and、uh, there are algorithms available to solve lasso. However, there are no closed form solution. To solve it, you need to do iterative optimization, and、uh, um, an intuitive way to understand how to solve lasso is the shrinkage operator. If you are not familiar with anything that I just talked about, go back to watch the lecture video of last time. <laughs> okay, and there are、um, some code snippets that I provide in the course material、um, in the Google Colab about how to do ridge regression and lasso regression. Because of time, I will not go through them here, but、uh, you please, please definitely take a look at them because they will be very helpful. For your homework too. 
Now, I want you to recall this diagram that I have drawn、uh, in previous lectures about the supervised learning. So,、uh, we talked about that、uh, given some supervised data,、um, namely the x and y, where the x are the inputs and the y's are the measurements,、uh, we can、uh, first use some feature extraction method. If you recall the basis functions, phi, this is a feature extraction method to give us a data matrix,、uh, the big A matrix or the big phi matrix. And then we can do model fitting to、uh, predict the y given, some,、uh, given the x. And uh, uh, we talked about uh, uh, the linear model for、uh, this model fitting problem. And、uh, after we have the predicted y from our model, then we want to compare them with the ground truth y, which is our measurement,、um, using some loss functions. And in the previous lectures, we talked about how to design our loss functions to、um, overcome the,、uh, the outliers and also to regularize、uh, the parameters you optimized from it. So,、um, Those、uh, previous lectures are about the losses. And now let's switch to the last part in this diagram, which is the optimization method. So, first, today, I'm going to give you a quick introduction of optimization.、Uh, we will go through、um, the optimality conditions of. Unconstrained optimization, we will talk about convexity and then we will move to constrained optimization. Notice that this class is not an optimization class. So, what we talked about here is very brief, is not comprehensive. So, if you want to study optimization or refresh your memory, please go to the optimization book that we list on the course website. And in our discussion today, We will, we will focus on、uh, providing you some geometric understanding, as always, of concepts in optimization. So, first, let's go to、um, the concept of unconstrained optimization. Unconstrained optimization. So, it is trying to minimize some loss functions, f, given some variables x. And our、uh, variable to optimize this x belongs to some domain or space. Let's call it big X. Okay? And we say if we find A, variable, a, a value for this variable x star belonging to our x domain. And、uh, this x star is a global minimizer if our f x star is smaller or equal to. All the fx in our domain. Okay? And、uh, the next definition is、um, the, since we have the global minimizer, now we want to define what is a local minimizer. So if a value、uh, of x is x star in our domain x, Is a local minimizer. It means f x star is smaller than f x for any x that belongs to a neighborhood. Uh, for the neighborhood, I use this、uh, B to represent this neighborhood.、Uh, the neighborhood 
centered around、uh, x star. So this neighborhood, this B, is defined as a sphere centered around x star, centered on x star, and with a radius of delta. Okay, so it's rigorously defined as all the x such that x minus x star to norm is smaller or equal to delta. Okay, here I want to、uh, make sure、uh, you don't get confused by my notation. If I write、um, a to norm. In this way, so if we have a vector x and we want to get the two norm, we will use the two as a subscript. Okay, so this is the two norm, and the two norm equals to the square root of、um, all the variables. Squared summing together, okay. So it, so it's the rooted sum square of the every element of x, and if I notice x with a two as a superscript, then it means the squared to norm. So it is the summation of. Xi squared, okay.、Um, I want to clarify it so that you don't get confused by my notation. So here, it is a two norm. Okay. So,、um, you if we use our intuitive way to、um, describe what is a global minimizer and what is a local minimizer, the global minimizer is the point that is minimal throughout the domain, X. And the local minimizer is uh, uh, the, gives you the smallest uh, function value uh, inside a、uh, ball that is centered around、uh, the x star. As long as you can find a ball that gives you、uh, the f x star is a minimal, then we can say、um, x star is a local minimizer. Okay. So the next thing、uh, is the uniqueness. Of global minimizer. Okay, so if x star is a global minimizer, then it has many properties we want to list here. First, the function value f x star is unique. Notice that we say the function value f x star is unique. However, the、uh, the global minimizer itself is not necessarily unique. This means、uh, there might be multiple points that gives you the minimal function value for f. So, for example, let's say our x is one dimensional, so it's a scalar, and、uh, the y axis、uh, is our objective function or loss function f. Okay, and uh, uh, this function has a shape. That looks like this, okay, and uh, uh, in the center, this part is flat. Then all the points、uh, on this flatting、uh, on this flat area is the global minimal, a global minimizer,、um, that that they give you the same minimal value for the f, but they are necessary. They are not unique, right, and.、Uh, The um the global minimizer 
is unique. Only when the cox when, when this loss function or objective function or cost function is strictly convex. That means it only when the uh, loss function f has this shape, then uh, our um, global minimizer is unique. And how we rigorously define convexity uh, is the second part of uh, today's lecture. But before we do that, let's talk about uh, several conditions that we can use to determine the optimality. We will talk about two conditions for optimality, which is the first and the second order optimality. Okay, so the first order condition is the gradient of a um, local or global minimizer should equal to zero. Okay, so notice this is only for unconstrained optimization. Uh, it is not true for constrained optimization. And the second order condition, which says the second order derivative of our loss function f at the optimal location x star should be um, greater or equal. So this he here, I write it uh, using this formula because the second order gradient might be a matrix and we have a name for it. It's called Hessian matrix. This Hessian matrix needs to be um, semi, a positive semi definite. Okay. And uh, if our x is one dimensional, then it's greater equal, uh, greater than or equal to zero. And for the first order, it's the same. Uh, it's a, uh, if x is a vector, then the first order derivative is a vector and it's called a Jacobian vector. And this Jacobian vector at the minimizer needs to equal to zero. Okay. So both conditions are um, necessary conditions. Okay. So they are necessary conditions to optimality. Okay. That's, that means if our x star is a local or global minimizer, then both conditions will hold. So we will have uh, f x first derivative equal to zero and the second order derivative to be positive semi-definite. Okay. So now the question is why those two conditions cannot give you the optimality, meaning why those two conditions are not sufficient for optimality. Okay, write it down. Why it is not sufficient. We just need a counterexample. So for example, we have a fx that equal to x cubic. Okay, and then at x equal to zero, uh, our uh, first order equal to zero and the second order derivative also equal to zero. However, if you remember the shape of x cubic, if we draw it 
it will look like this. So, uh, so the zero location is not a global minimal point nor a local minimal point. Okay. So, here is a counter example of why those two conditions are not sufficient. And what is the sufficient condition then? I will write it down here. So sufficient condition. If first order optimality condition is satisfied, and then we need to slightly modify the second order optimality, the second order derivative need to be positive definite, strictly positive definite. Okay, let me use red here to emphasize. If this is true, then x star is a local or a global minimizer. Okay, now let's take a deeper look at uh, each of those two conditions. First is the first order optimality condition. Okay, why this is true? Okay, so let's prove it. If our x star is the minimizer, okay, let's use a uh, uh, use a counter proof to show uh, this is true. Okay, so let's say we pick a direction, pick any direction d and uh, a step size epsilon. Okay, and we move our x star to the direction d by step epsilon, okay? Then we can do the Taylor series expansion, okay? Here is the Taylor series expansion. It equals to fx star plus epsilon times the gradient of f at x star inner product the direction d and plus some uh, some terms uh, that's in order of epsilon squared now let's rearrange everything so on our left hand side let's keep f x star plus epsilon d and we move f x star to the left hand side and we divide everything by epsilon so on the right hand side, we will have the gradient of f at x star in the product d plus this o epsilon. And uh, because uh, this o of epsilon is, uh, uh, is uh, something that's uh, at the order of epsilon, right? And if we limit our epsilon to be very small, to be close to zero, then this term, this O of epsilon can uh, go to zero and we can ignore it. All right, so we have this equation now. On the left-hand side, we have fx star plus epsilon d minus fx star and uh, over epsilon, right? And on the right-hand side, we have um, we have our gradient times d. All right, so remember that we say this x star is the minimizer. That means all the f x star plus epsilon d will be greater or equal to um, f x star, right? So the right hand side, uh, so the left hand side is greater or equal greater than or equal to zero for all the d, for all the directions, right? 
Okay, so that means the right hand side is also greater than or equal to zero for all the directions d. Okay, if let's say, uh, uh, if we use an intuitive way to understand this, if there is um, if our x is two dimensional, okay, then the gradient of f will also be a two-dimensional vector. Okay, so let's say this is the gradient of fx star. And, uh, and then we ha have uh, the d vector to be anything, any vectors on this plane. Okay, and uh, we can always find a d vector. We can always find a d vector let's say, in this direction, such that the inner product of the gradient of f and d is smaller than the zero. In fact, in this case, um, the, mod the inner product of those two vectors will be smaller than zero. Then it, is, it will be contradictory to our observation here that this gradient multiplying any d vector is greater or equal than zero. And there is only one possibility that uh, this uh, inequality can always hold true for any d, and that is when the gradient is zero. Okay? So, this is, this is true only when the gradient of f at x star equal to zero. So this gives us the proof of um, the first order optimality. Now let's prove the second order optimality, which is the second order derivative of f is positive semi-definite at the minimizer. Okay, so the proof uh, is in the same spirit as the first order optimality. Suppose we have a minimizer x star and uh, a random direction and a step size uh, d and epsilon, and move the minimizer by epsilon d. Then, using Taylor's series expansion, it equals to f x star plus epsilon times the first order derivative, which already we already know. And let's keep doing the expansion. Uh, the second order derivative. Okay, so this is the second order term plus some residual that is in the order of epsilon cubic. Okay, we already know from the first order optimality that this is zero, right? Okay. And we only have the second order and zeroth order and the residual here. By moving things around, we can have one over epsilon square times f x star plus epsilon d minus f x star equal to a half times d transpose second order derivative of f times d plus epsilon over 6 some residual term. Okay? 
Let's play the same trick that we limit our epsilon to be close to zero. If we do that, um, the residual term will go to zero. Can be ignored. All right. S similarly, because our f of x star gives the minimal uh, value, then on the left hand side, the left hand side must be greater or equal than zero. And this is true for all the uh, d vectors, right? And this means for all the d vectors, this one half times d transpose second order derivative f times d is always greater than, greater than or equal to zero. And it is for all the d vectors, okay? And uh, this is, if you recall, one of the definition of the positive semi-definite, okay? So, uh, so this tells us the second order derivative of f at x star is positive semi-definite. So that gives us the proof. Okay, so the first order derivative is pretty easy uh, to illustrate and think of. How about the second order derivative? Let me um, use some visualization to help you understand the geometric meaning of the second order derivative. If you recall the different definitions of positive semi-definite, For a positive semi-definite matrix, the eigenvalues of it needs to be um, positive or equal to zero. Okay, so um, so let's uh, restrict the problem, restrict our matrix um, to be two by two. That is, uh, our x vector is two dimensional. Okay, so our x direction x vector has two dimension, so that we can visualize our loss function in a three uh, D coordinate. Okay, so. When our second order derivative at the uh, minimizer is positive definite, then it means the two eigenvalues, let's say it's called, called lambda one, lambda two, they are both greater than zero. Then the uh the objective function that you're gonna see is probably this shape. Okay, and uh, here is the minimizer x star. Okay, and uh, if uh, the second order derivative is uh, positive semi-definite. Then it means maybe one of the eigenvector, uh, sorry, eigenvalue is zero. So let's say lambda one is greater than zero and lambda two is zero. Then the loss function is probably, uh, I, I'll just say it's probably uh, this shape that 
is uh, so it will look convex in one direction and it will look flat in the other direction and in this case uh, there will be uh, many many minimizers and let's say uh, this is our uh, S star. So one direction, uh, there will be, uh, it, it will look convex, but on the other direction, it will look flat. Okay. And uh, uh, the last situation, let me draw here. When um, our second order derivative is not positive semi-definite nor positive definite, okay? And let's say, in that case, um, one of the eigenvalue is greater than zero and the other is negative, okay? And in that case, uh, we will have some interesting shape for the, pos uh, for, the um, uh, for our loss function. Okay, so it will look like so our loss function will have this kind of shape okay and uh, this is called a saddle shape because it looks like a saddle and uh, and our x star will be at this location okay so this x star is no longer a minimizer anymore but you can see because one of the eigenvalue is greater than zero so this x star is still the um uh, it is uh, the minimizer in one direction. However, because the other eigenvalue is smaller than zero, it is actually the maximizer in another direction. Okay? So you can see the connection between the eigenvalues and the shapes of, um, of the loss function. And uh, the last situation is when our uh, second order derivative is um, negative definite. And in that case, your uh, loss function will be uh, uh, this one flipped so that the, the loss function is a concave loss function and x star will be the local maximizer um, instead of local minimizer. Okay, above are the discussion about the first and second order optimality for unconstrained optimization. Next, we're going to talk about an important concept in optimization, which is convexity. Why is convexity important? This is because most of the uh, optimization problem are not easy to solve. Let me give you an example. For example, if our loss function f of x equals to uh, log sum of over i from 1 to m exponential of ai transpose x plus bi. Okay, so this loss function is uh, actually has a name. It is called log sum exponential function because of its format. Okay, so if our log loss function is in this shape, the solution of the minimizer is non-trivial. Uh, we cannot simply take the gradient of this loss function and set it to zero and find the x star that, min that gives zero for this gradient because the gradient is very complicated. Actually, uh, if I write it down, it's, it's, it's having the form of uh, 1 over sum exponential t 
times sum over exponential times ai. Okay, and if you set this to zero and so and try to solve for x, uh, the solution is not it will not be trivial. It's very hard actually. You need to use iterative algorithms such as gradient descent or Newton's method to do this uh, solution. And uh, there are automatic tools people design for us to do it. However, these pro these kind of um, loss functions are not suitable for us to study optimization because they are too complicated. So we want to restrict our discussion to a specific, specific kind of um, loss function, and that is the convex loss functions. Okay, so because we want to study that, let's first see the definition of convex function. Okay, definition. Let x from domain x and uh, y also from domain x be two um, random points in this domain x. And uh, let lambda to be a coefficient between 0 and 1. A function f that goes from um, R n to R is convex over this domain X if F times F of lambda X plus one minus lambda Y is smaller equal to lambda times fx plus 1 minus lambda times fy. Okay, and if uh, this smaller or equal to sign becomes uh, strictly smaller than then f is also called strictly convex. Okay? So this definition is easier to be understood in um, ge geometric illustration. So let's say uh, our x and y are uh, in 1D. Okay, these are x and y's. And uh, let's say this is our uh, f function. Okay, this is our f. So uh, our f of x value is here. This is f of x. And uh, this is f of y. So um, the left hand side is the linear combination of. Um, x and y, right? So that will give you a point between x and y. So this is lambda lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y. And uh, the function value is here, which is f lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y. Okay? And on the right hand side, this is um, the mid some middle points between the connection of fx and fy. Okay, so this is actually the connection between uh, the, the the middle point but, uh, between the connection of fx and fy. So here is the lambda fx plus 1 minus lambda times fy. 
So this, uh, if this theorem is this definition is saying the uh, function value between two points will be smaller than uh, the the interpolation of the function values of the two points. Okay, so uh, the function actual function will always be below or at least equal to the connection of those two points. Okay, if that is true, then it is a convex. Okay, so let's say if, uh, if our f function looks like this, then this is not true anymore because uh, if we have two points that are here, and we make the connection, and the interpolated point will be below the actual function value at that point. So in that case, uh, this function will not be convex anymore. OK. Let me give you some examples. Here are four examples of convex functions well, where the x is 2D, okay? So you can, uh, I want you to tell me which one is convex and which one is not. So first one is this. Is this a convex function? I will pause for five seconds. It is not, right? Because if you have um, two points, and connect them, you can see the function value is actually above the connection. And as we talked before, that this, this is actually a saddle point. All right, so next, is this a convex function? Yes, it is. But is this a strictly convex function? No, why not? It is because in one of the direct in one dimension. So in this dimension, if this is x, this is y, the connection of x and y is equal to the actual function value. So this is a convex function, but it is not a strict, not a strictly convex function. Okay, third case. It's pretty simple. It is. It is not only a convex, but also a strictly convex function. And the fourth one, it is not. It is a concave function. Okay, now we want to talk about how to verify if a function is convex or not. So first is definitely by definition. We can check if the definition of convexity holds for a given function. Right? And uh, the second way to check is to use the first order convexity. I will write it down first. So Fy will be greater or equal than Fx plus the gradient of F and X inner product Y minus X. To see why this is true, let's draw a convex function, and let's say this point is x, okay, and this point is y. What this is saying is that um, fy is above the tangent line that goes uh, from the location x, right, because the right-hand side equals to fx plus this gradient times y minus x which is this tangent line, this tangent line, okay? 
So, uh, so this is the second way to verify if it is a convex function. Okay, the third method is to use the second order convexity, which says if the second order gradient of f is positive semi-definite everywhere, okay, so everywhere in the domain, then our um, function f is convex. Okay, and uh, this is telling us the curvature of the function is positive or at least a zero. Okay, and all the above three conditions to verify convexity, they are all necessary and sufficient to verify convexity. So it really depends on what kind of problem you are facing, and you can decide which way you want to use to verify convexity. Okay, now let's jump to the last part for today's lecture, the constrained optimization. So we will talk about uh, the simplest case for constraint optimization, which is the equality constraints. The purpose of doing this is to try to give you a geometric explanation of the Lagrangian. As this is not an optimization class, if you want to read about uh, the inequality constraint optimization, uh, you can go to uh, the tutorial that I made, that I have uh, on the uh, course website. If you go to the course website, uh, go to tutorials uh, and tutorial four, there will be a detailed review of uh, the general constraint optimization problem and how to solve it. All right. So we want to look at uh, the simplest case, which is the equality constraint. optimization. So we want to minimize a loss function f of x and uh, our x is n-dimensional and uh, there is a constraint subject to h j of x equal to zero. Okay, and we can generalize it to uh, many, many constraints. Let's say we have k constraints here. Okay, to solve this uh, equality constraint problem, we need to use the Lagrangian function. So the Lagrangian function is defined as, uh, we use the notation L to represent it. It is a function of x, and some extra variables we call v here, okay? And uh, the definition of it is fx minus summation of from 1 to k vj times hj of x, where hj is the equality constraint. And I know in some of the textbooks, you can see they use some sign here. And uh, that's fine, because that's just to flip the values of the v. Um, so they are totally uh, equivalent to each other. Okay, and uh, if we, um, we, and we can define our v vector to be the collection of all the vj's in the summation, okay? And this v vector is called Lagrangian multiplier because it is something that, multiple, that, that multiplies the equality constraint. 
or we have another name called we call it duo variables okay now um, here is uh, a conclusion we're not gonna prove it here but the solution of the Lagrangian function, let's call it x star and v star, it needs to satisfy um, the following first order optimality, which is the gradient of Lagrangian with respect to x at the optimal point is zero. And the partial gradient of Lagrangian function with respect to V at the optimal point is also zero. And also the X star is the minimizer of the original um, optimization problem, okay? so. Um, so this is, uh, let me uh, emphasize here. So this is a sufficient condition. Okay, so if X star is a minimizer of the original constraint optimization problem, then uh, the Lagrangian function must have the have a optimizer which is x star and v star, and this x star and v star will satisfy um, uh, these optimality con conditions. So, uh, to solve the Lagrangian function, what we need to do is to first define the Lagrangian function and then calculate the first order optimality to find out all the possible x stars and v stars that satisfies these constraints. And then find out the x star that, that, is, the optima, uh, that is the minimizer of the original um, optimization problem. Okay, so what I said was a pretty um, hard to understand intuitively, so let's use an example. Okay. So, um, our loss function uh, equals to x1 plus x2. So in this case, our x is a two-dimensional variable. And our constraint is that x1 squared plus x2 squared equal to 2. Okay. So, let's first use the Lagrangian function to solve this problem. So we can define the Lagrangian of x and v to be... Um, f x1 x2 and uh, minus v times uh, x1 squared plus x2 squared minus 2 because we need to move uh, the 2 to the other side to satisfy the of the formality okay and because we only have one constraint uh, our v just to be a scalar here, okay, and we, we can substitute substitute uh, x one x and x two uh, using the actual formula. So let's first take the gradient of our Lagrangian with respect to x, and it give us first taking the gradient with respect to x one that give us one plus x to 2 with respect to x1 is 0 and minus 2v 
x1, right? And uh, um, taking the gradient with respect to x2 give us 0 plus 1 minus 2v x2. And we want that to equal to 0. Okay? And uh, at the same time, we want the partial gradient with respect to v to be 0, which equals to x1 squared plus x2 squared minus 2 equal to 0. Okay, now those three things can give us um, three equality, the three equations. First is um, 2vx1 equal to 1. Second is 2vx2 equal to 1. And third is x1 squared plus x2 squared equal to 2. Okay. If we want to solve it, we can uh, take, uh, we replace uh, x1 by 1 over 2v and also x2 by 1 over 2v for the third equation. And that will give us 1 over 4v squared plus 1 over 4v squared equal to 2. Okay, and by doing the calculations, we have two possibilities, v equal to 1 over 2 or v equal to negative 1 over 2. And in the first case, x1 will equal to x2 equal to 1, right? And the second case, x1 equal to x2 equal to negative 1, okay? So, only in those two situations, the, uh, the Lagrangian condition holds, right? And uh, we just need to find uh, the optimal solution from those two conditions. First, if x1 and x2 are equal to 1, then our f function is equal to 2. And then if x1 and x2 are equal to negative 1, then um, this function equal to negative 2. So that's clear uh, that our optimal solution is this case, when x1 and x2 equal to negative 1. And this is uh, not our, it's, this is not the minimizer for this uh, optimization problem. So you can see the solution for the Lagrangian opt optimality is not necessarily the, um, uh, the, the minimizer. However, the minimizer will definitely be within um, the subset that satisfies the Lagrangian optimality. Okay, now we can understand uh, this problem from a geometric perspective. Okay, so let's draw a 2D coordinate, x1, x2. Okay, and uh, we can draw our constraint. The constraint is a circle, right? We only allow values um, on this, uh, on the circle, right? The circle has a radius of square root of two, okay? And uh, the loss function, um, this, f, uh, this f function, uh, has a level set that looks linear, okay? So um, and the, the, the level sets means um, all the uh, x that falls on the same level set will give you the same function value. So uh, all the uh, x1, x2 combination for on this line give you the same function value. And all the x1, x2 on this line gives you the same function value. And the, the uh, 
and the function value increases as this level set goes to uh, to the right and to the to the top. Okay, so because we want to minimize the function value, we want to find the level set that's intersect with this circle, but give you the smallest um, function value. And that is when the level set uh, is tangent to um, is tangent to this um, to this circle, right? So the intersection will be at this location. Okay, and uh, you can see what's the coordinate of this location. It is negative one, negative one. Okay, now I want you to listen very carefully as this is something that is uh, not very trivial to understand. So, because this um, circle is our hx uh, equal to zero, right? And, um, and uh, if we take the gradient of our h, function, which is the constraint function, uh, with respect to x, the gradient of this function is actually perpendicular to, um, to the circle, right? So these are the gradient. of our constraint function h. Okay, and uh, then if uh, we know this blue function, bl th those blue uh, lines represent the, uh, the loss function f. So if we take the gradient with respect to uh, x for this loss function, then the gradient will always point to the same direction and it's a, uh, it's constant right because uh because f is a um is a linear function with respect to x1 and x2 so this is the gradient of our fx okay so if you recall um the one of the Lagrangian optimality condition is the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x to be zero, right? And this equal to the gradient of f with respect to x minus v times the gradient of our h with respect to x. If you go back to C, uh, based on the definition of our um, Lagrangian function, the gradient should have this form. So, uh, and we set it to be zero. So that means the gradient of the loss function Should equal to v times the gradient of the constraint function, and it tell this is this means those two gradient should be on the same line. They should point to uh, the same direction or opposite direction, but they should be on the same line. Okay, so if you look at all the points on this. A constraint function. Okay, um, where are where are those points such that the gradient of the constraint function and the gradient of the loss function point to the same line or the opposite direction? There are only two points, right? One is here, where uh, the h x is this direction and f x is also direction this direction. When when uh, the 
circle is tangent to the line. And the other is here, where the gradient of h is this direction and the gradient of f is this direction. Uh, this is also where the, um, the circle is tangent to the line. Okay, so those two locations are where the Lagrangian optimality constraint are satisfied. And you can see uh, it actually is the two solutions that we solved before. Okay, so you can see the Lagrangian um, what optimality constraint is to find those locations where the gradient of the constraint is in the same line as the gradient of the loss function. That is how you can understand this Lagrangian using a geometric perspective. All right, now let's look at another example for uh, minimization with constraint. We want to minimize a half times x minus x0 to norm squared, where x is a n-dimensional vector, and the constraint is ax equal to y. Okay, so we can uh, use uh, uh, another way to interpret this problem, which is we want to find the solution of this a linear regression problem, but we want the solution x to be as close to the x0 as possible. So that is a previous way. Uh, what we have discussed, uh, how we can interpret such kind of linear regression problem. Okay, and uh, we want to solve it using Lagrangian here. So the Lagrangian for this optimization problem is the loss function minus Lagrangian times the constraint, which is ax minus y. Okay, so the first order optimality condition or the Lagrangian optimality condition says the partial gradient of Lagrangian is zero So this is the partial gradient with respect to x, and then the partial gradient with respect to uh, v is ax minus y, and it's also 0. Okay, so what we want to do now is to find out uh, what is the x and what is the v in these cases. Okay, and uh, what we're gonna do uh, is to use a trick. So let's multiply a matrix A on both sides of this first equation. Okay, and that gives us A X minus A x0 minus a times a transpose v equal to 0, right? And rearrange it a little bit, It'll give us ax minus ax0 equal to a, a transpose v. Okay, and then because we already said ax equal to y, so replacing this with y gives um, y minus ax0 equal to a, a transpose v. And uh, let's move a, a transpose v to the left-hand side. That gives us this. So this is um, under the condition to 
just we need to be careful. This is only possible only when a times a transpose inverse exists, right? That means this is invertible. Okay. So now we have um, our the definition of V here. Okay. And then what we do is to substitute V in this uh, first equation. And, uh, and that will give us x equal to x0 plus a transpose, and then v will be replaced by a times a transpose inverse times y minus a x0. So this is only possible when a and a a times a transpose is um, is invertible. Okay, uh, which is if you recall um, that a is a short and fat matrix and a is full column rank. Let's use a simplified version of this problem to tell the geometric meaning. So let's simplify the problem into the loss function stays the same. The difference between x and a, a fixed point x of zero, and we are optimizing over n-dimensional vectors. And the constraint, instead of a x equal to y, we set it to be uh, w transpose x equal to zero. Okay. And uh, in this case, the W transpose times X equal to zero is a hyperplane, right? So let's draw a hyperplane. It's defined by W transpose X equal to zero. All right, so um, then the X zero can be think of as the point that is outside this plane. And we want to find a point X on this plane that has the shortest distance to x0. And where that will happen, if we use our geometric knowledge, uh, that will happen when x0, x is perpendicular to this plane, right? And uh, uh, if you uh, recall from our uh, knowledge of geometry, we actually have a conclusion that uh, this uh, this line from um, x zero to x, uh, sorry, from x to x zero, it equal to w transpose x zero over w two norm square. times w, okay? So our x can be written as x0 minus w transpose x0 w uh, two norm squared times w. Okay, and uh, if we recall from um, our conclusion from the previous page, let's write the conclusion using what we have got from the previous page. It equals to x0 plus um, our A matrix becomes W. So W times W uh, transpose W inverse times um, Y, where is or in this case, y is just 0, w transpose x0, okay? And uh, 
because this W transpose times W is just a number, then it give us x0 plus, and our plus sign can change to uh, minus here, and uh, um, W transpose x0, which is this term, and over W transpose times W, that, uh, that is um, 2 norm squared times W vector, which is this, right? So you can see this is exactly the same as what we already have from the ge geometry class. So uh, you can understand um, this optimization problem from this geometric perspective. As we told you several methods to solve optimization by hand. We, we talked about the first and second order optimality and the Lagrangian multipliers, right? And in practice, you don't have to do this by hand. Uh, in fact, we have pretty handy tools for you to solve optimization problem automatically. So here is one that we use for this class, the CVXPy. It is short for convex Python. Okay, and it is developed by people from Stanford University. And here are some examples that uh, shows you how to use it. I uh, have put this uh, code uh, on the course website. You can um, play with it. Um, actually, please do play with it. So here is the first problem that solves an unconstrained optimization problem. And it is actually a rich regression problem. So first, I de develop, uh, I, I, de I defined some um, matrices A and B, okay? And uh, uh, actually, the loss function is the log sum exponential loss function that I showed you in today's class that has a very crazy gradient. Okay, so uh, we not only want to minimize this log sum exponential, but we also have a regret. Uh, we have a regularization term, which um, constrained, uh, which regularizes the uh, magnitude of our uh, variable x. So first, we define our x uh, using cp dot variable, and this d uh, defines the dimension of x. Then we define the, our loss function using cp dot minimize, and what's inside is the loss function. And uh, you don't have to write the log sum exponential by yourself. This, uh, the convex pi package provides an implementation for you. And please use their implementation because each of those functions has uh, a, an embedded gradient uh, in it. So um, if you implement this function yourself, this convex pi uh, package needs to uh, do the gradient propagation, uh, which might cause uh, the gradient error, the numerical error. So do use their cp.log sum exponential function. And, uh, and then plus lambda times uh, also use their cp.sum squares, uh, which is uh, the two norm square of x. Okay? And then constraints, there are no constraints. Okay? So we define the convex optimization problem to be objective function and constraints. So that gives us a data structure called a prob. Then we just do prob.solve, and that will, ref that will return the optimal um, x star, which minimizes the objective function. And now I print it out. I print the both the objective. Uh, OK, sorry. So this optimal objective value prints out the optimal uh, loss function value. And if you do x dot value, it gives you what the optimal um, x is that minimizes the objective function. OK, here is uh, the CBX demo of the example that we just uh, talked about that tries to uh, minimize the distance between the variable and a defined ve vector, and, and such that the variable satisfies a linear uh, regression problem. Okay? 
So here are the definition of the A matrix, uh, the X0 matrix, uh, and the Y matrix. And also we defined a X star uh, as the um, um, uh, inherent um, matrix to generate the Y matrix. Okay, and then we define our X as a variable and objective function. Um, here we directly use their implementation of two norm, okay? So please do use this norm, cp.norm to calculate two norm. Do not calculate yourself. And also we have a constraints, which is A times X equal to Y. And uh, then the problem can be defined as uh, CP dot problem, objective, and constraints. And similarly, we do solve, and we can find out the optimal value and the X value. And we can compare the solution with um, the actual solution from, um, from our um, hand calculation. And you can see they agree with each other. All right, so uh, that's it for today. Please do play with this code so that you get more familiar with uh, the CVXPy package. We will uh, ask you to use it in the next homework.